Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. I'm going to be doing an A to Z of dermatology, which will be a whistle-stop tour of some important dermatological conditions to help you in your preparation for exams. On my channel, you'll also find separate videos for inflammatory skin conditions and skin cancers. In this first video, we'll fly through some conditions from A to H. So let's begin. A is for acanthosis nigricans. In acanthosis nigricans, there is hyperpigmentation or darkening and hyperkeratosis or thickening of the skin. This results in symmetrical dark plaques commonly found in the folds of the skin at the axilla, but also around the neck and groin. It may also be associated with pruritus, papillomatosis, and skin tags. Acanthosis nigricans may be benign or malignant. Benign is the most common type. It is common in darker skinned individuals and is not a sign of any underlying sinister conditions. Malignant is when acanthosis nigricans is a manifestation of internal malignancy, like GI cancers. Acanthosis nigricans is often a sign of insulin resistance. Can you think of any conditions that can cause insulin resistance? Some causes of insulin resistance are PCOS, obesity, diabetes mellitus, and Prader-Willi syndrome. Other important causes of acanthosis nigricans include acromegaly, Cushing's disease, hypothyroidism, and iatrogenic, for example, use of the combined oral contraceptive pill. B is for bullous pemphigoid. Bullous pemphigoid is an autoimmune condition causing sub-epidermal blistering of the skin. An injury, a skin infection, or drug, like gliptins, antibiotics, or furosemide, can trigger the onset of disease. Bullous pemphigoid is more common in elderly patients, particularly those with neurological diseases like Parkinson's. In bullous pemphigoid, the patient will report tense, fluid-filled blisters which rupture, forming crusted erosions. To manage bullous pemphigoid, the first step is referral to dermatology for biopsy and confirmation of the diagnosis. The first-line treatment is oral corticosteroids, and as patients will be given steroids for several weeks, they should be given alongside a PPI like omeprazole to prevent gastric erosions. Topical corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, and antibiotics are also used. Bullous pemphigoid can be differentiated from pemphigus vulgaris, another blistering skin condition, by a few features. Bullous pemphigoid is characterized by round, tense blisters, which are less likely to erode as they're sub-epidermal, while pemphigus vulgaris is characterized by flat and flaccid blisters, which burst easily as they're intra-epidermal. This difference can be seen on examination and is known as the Nikolsky sign. Patients with bullous pemphigoid will be Nikolsky negative, and patients with pemphigus will be Nikolsky positive, which means that the blisters burst easily when gently rubbed. Remember this as pemphigus positive. Also, pemphigus vulgaris commonly affects mucosal membranes, whereas this is less common for bullous pemphigoid. C is for cellulitis. Cellulitis is a spreading bacterial infection of the skin involving the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Compare this to erysipelas, which is an acute superficial form of cellulitis and involves the upper dermis. Cellulitis may be caused by Streptococcus pyogenes or Staphylococcus aureus. Risk factors include immunosuppression, wounds, leg ulcers, skin injury, obesity and lymphedema. Cellulitis most commonly affects the lower limbs. Patients will present with a warm, painful area of erythema with a poorly defined border, unlike erysipelas, which is well defined, and associated with edema. In many cases, you will see evidence of a compromised skin barrier, which allowed entry of the pathogens, for example, a wound, an ulcer, or an insect bite. They will also probably be systemically unwell. Cellulitis is a clinical diagnosis, however, if there is an atypical presentation, the patient is very unwell, or there is failure to respond to treatment, cultures from possible portals of entry may be very valuable. If the diagnosis is in doubt, blood culture as well as swabs and culture of any blister fluid may also be helpful. Consider calculating the Wells score if you're suspicious of DVT. In terms of management, supportive care should be given including rest, 
leg elevation, sterile dressings, and analgesia. Oral antibiotics like flucloxacillin or erythromycin are also given to treat cellulitis. If the patient is systemically unwell or there is a severe infection, he or she will need to be admitted to hospital for fluids, IV antibiotics, oxygen, and monitoring. D is for dermatitis. There are many types of dermatitis, but we will be focusing on contact dermatitis. This is an inflammatory skin condition triggered by contact with an irritant or allergen. There are two main types of contact dermatitis. Irritant contact dermatitis, which is more common, is a non-allergic reaction due to weak acids or alkalis, like detergents or cement. It is often seen on the hands. And allergic contact dermatitis, which is less common, is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. It occurs after sensitization and subsequent re-exposure to an allergen. It's often seen on the head following hair dyes. Appearance may vary, but often contact dermatitis presents as discrete erythematous papules and vesicles with crusting. The lesions may be associated with burning, stinging, or soreness in irritant contact dermatitis, or with pruritus in allergic contact dermatitis. Now moving on to management, advise the patient to avoid contact with the irritant, for example use gloves, and rinse skin with warm water and an emollient as soon as possible after coming into contact with the allergen or irritant. Emollients and emollient soap substitutes should be prescribed, along with advice to make sure the patient applies copious amounts of emollients as frequently as possible. Topical steroids can be prescribed for allergic contact dermatitis and it may be necessary to prescribe short courses of oral steroids for acute severe episodes. E is for erythema multiforme. Erythema multiforme is an acute self-limiting hypersensitivity reaction which is most commonly triggered by infections like the herpes simplex virus, streptococcus, mycoplasma, but it can also be triggered by drugs like penicillin, the COCP and NSAIDs. Erythema multiforme can be completely idiopathic. Erythema multiforme is characterized by target lesions initially seen on the back of hands or feet before spreading to the torso. It may be associated with pruritus as well. Usually, no specific investigations are indicated. However, if the diagnosis is uncertain or there is recurrent erythema multiforme without a known trigger, then a skin biopsy may be indicated. Conservative treatment may include analgesics and local skin care. If a drug is thought to be responsible, it must be withdrawn. If an infection is suspected, it should be treated. Steroid creams may also be used. F is for fungal nail infections. Lovely. Onychomycosis is usually caused by dermatophytes, mainly trichophyton rubrum. Risk factors for fungal nail infections include diabetes mellitus, immunosuppression or previous nail trauma. You cannot treat before microbiology confirmation of the diagnosis. Therefore, it's essential to send nail clippings and scrapings of the affected nail for microscopy and culture. No management is necessary if the patient has no concerns and is not affected by the symptoms. However, if the symptoms are problematic, then oral terbinafine is currently recommended first line for dermatophyte infections. Treatment must be given for up to three months for fungal nail infections and up to six months for toenail infections. This is to allow time for the nail to grow out completely. G is for guttate psoriasis. Guttate psoriasis is more common in children and adolescents than adults. Patients on examination will have teardrop-shaped scaly erythematous papules on the trunk and limbs. These lesions are sometimes precipitated by a streptococcal infection usually two to four weeks before the onset of guttate psoriasis. Most cases actually resolve spontaneously within two to three months. However, you can consider prescribing emollients, vitamin D analogues, and topical steroids. And tonsillectomy may be necessary with recurrent episodes as streptococcal infections tend to commonly trigger guttate psoriasis. Lastly for this video, H is for herpes zoster infection, aka shingles. Shingles is an acute, unilateral, painful, blistering rash caused by reactivation of the varicella zoster virus, also known as herpes zoster. If the varicella zoster virus reactivates in the geniculate ganglion of the seventh cranial nerve, causing the rash to occur around the ear, then this is referred to as Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, or herpes zoster otticus. Infection with varicella normally occurs in childhood, 
producing vesicles filled with high levels of the virus, and this is known as chickenpox. After primary infection, the virus persists in the dorsal root ganglia of the CNS. Reactivation takes place after many years as a result of immunosuppression. This leads to infection and characteristic lesions in the dermatome served by the infected ganglia. The first symptom of shingles is severe pain associated with malaise, fever, headache and lymphadenopathy. This is followed by the eruption of erythematous papules and vesicles which blister before crusting over. These papules and vesicles occur in the region of the skin supplied by one dermatome, therefore the rash does not cross the midline. Oral acyclovir is first-line management for shingles. Analgesia such as paracetamol and NSAIDs must also be given. Complications include scarring, secondary bacterial infection, post-hepatic neuralgia, and herpes zoster ophthalmicus. The shingles vaccine is now offered to all patients between the ages of 70 and 79 in the UK. It's a subcutaneous injection that is life attenuated, therefore it cannot be given to patients who are immunosuppressed. Thanks for watching! Please share and comment on this video and don't forget to subscribe.